Well, hello. Today's video is first in a series of little videos that we'll have about some variations on how to do Punnett squares. Um, in the several hundred years since Mendel discovered the idea of uh, genetics and since Mr. Punnett invented Punnett squares, we now realize that there's a lot more different ways that certain traits can get inherited that's not just simple dominance and recessiveness. So um, this little video here is, like I said, number one of a series, uh, and it's going to kind of introduce some new ideas called co-dominance and incomplete dominance. And we'll be able to look at these by looking at uh, doing little Punnett squares and spe specifically by looking at phenotype ratios is the key thing. So first trait. Cat hair. It's something that's all over my house. Uh, but what happens if you breed a long-haired cat like the one on the right and a short-haired cat like the one on the left? So expectation is, if this is regular Mendelian dominant recessiveness, that the dominant trait will appear in all of the kids, whether it's long hair or short hair. So what are the results? Aww, nothing like kittens. Um, the result is all short-haired kittens. So therefore, our conclusion has to be that Short hair is dominant to long hair. And that's pretty much what we're used to, right? Uh, by the way, coat color, the gray in there, is a different gene than the length of the hair. Take a look at all the hair length. It's all nice little short fuzzy kittens. So how do we represent this? Again, you know how to do this. Uh, if it's a simple Mendelian trait like cat coat length, um, we would set up a little Punnett square like this. We have a, you know, a parent up here at the top. Here's our short hair parent with big S, big S, because short is dominant. Here's our long haired parent. It's a little hard to tell, but these are little S's, little S's, because that must be recessive. And then how do we fill in our Punnett square? Well, we take one from each parent. So we would fill it in by doing big S, little S. Um, we would have a little S from here and a little S from that side. We'd have a big error, you know, bottom left would be big S, little s, and then bottom right would be big S and little s. Again, one more time. So what does this look like for us? What's our genotype and phenotype ratio? Well, our genotype ratio be, should be pretty straightforward. It's 100% because they're all the same, big S, little s. Right, pretty straightforward. How about our phenotype ratio? Well, big S is dominant and big S stands for short, therefore we know that, oops, sorry, not 1,005, 100% short hair. So again, with this, we've got our genotype ratio, phenotype ratio, pretty much what we'd expect it to be. Take a look down here. How many alleles do we have? We have a long allele and a short allele, so we just have two. How many phenotypes do we have? Our phenotypes are short, short hair, or long, long hair, so we have two phenotypes. And the expression for this is dominant only, uh, if there's a heterozygous, right? There you go. So if we have a regular Mendelian trait, we have two alleles, we have two phenotypes, dominant recessive, and then if we're heterozygous, we only see the dominant trait. This is kind of important because the others follow a real different pattern. So let's take a look at a, a different example. It is chickens. Hold on, where's my chickens? There they are. So here we go. What happens if you breed a black chicken and a white chicken together? Well, for certain breeds of chicken anyway. Uh, expectation, again, if this was really simple dominant Mendelian recessiveness, that the dominant trait will appear in all the chicks, and all the chicks will either be all black or they will be all white. So let's take a look at what we get. Check your chickens. I love saying that, checker chickens. I don't know why that sounds fun, but checker chickens are actually a little different. They're not black and they're not white. They're actually Black and white. If you kind of look at that picture, I know it's a little blurry, but they have black feathers and they have white feathers, and they sort of alternate in a checkerboard pattern all over themselves. So our conclusion here is that we can't say that black is dominant, we can't say that white is dominant, because both of them are being expressed. So we have a different name for this. This is called codominant, and you can see it up here at the top, codominant traits. A little different pattern where both traits get expressed in here. So how does this work? Let's take a look at our next kind of generation here. What if we were to breed these two checkered chickens together? So here's a checkered pattern, right, B and W, and here's a checkered parent here at B and W. Notice how this is a little different. Because they're co-dominant, I used two capital letters, a capital B because black is dominant, and a capital W because W is also dominant. B for black, W for white. A little different than the dominant recessive ones that we see where it's an uppercase, lowercase. Again, co-dominant, both capital letters. So what do we get when we take two checkered uh, chickens and breed them together? Well, it turns out that in this top square we get big B, big B. Top right, we get big B, W. Bottom left, we get big B, W again. I could do W, B, it doesn't really matter. And in the bottom right, I get W, W. 
Here we are, one from each parent. So what do we get in our genotype phenotype ratio from these guys? Well, what's our genotype ratio? We get one big B to big B. We get two of these heterozygous BWs, and we get one, that's WW. That's our new genotype ratio. How about our phenotype ratio? What are we going to get here? Remember, both of these are dominant. So big B, big B is black. And it's a, just like the first one, it's a fully black chicken. How about the BWs? Well, there's two of them, and they are both checkered. Can't type, apparently. And then the last one, WW, is white. So we have a little bit of a different thing here with our phenotype and our genotype ratios. It looks a little different than it did in our previous example. So let's kind of summarize here. First of all, how many alleles did we have? Well, there's only two. There's a black allele and a white allele. So that's kind of the same. How many phenotypes do we have now? Well, take a look back over here. We don't just have two phenotypes. In this particular case now, we have a total of three phenotypes, and that's one of the hallmarks of kind of a different type of inheritance. And then lastly, our expression, we get both of them get expressed, black and white, both dominant. We call that codominant. All right, let's move on forward. What's our next kind of example? What happens if you get red carnations and white carnations bred together? Kind of like our last example, right? Well, if it's dominant, we should expect all red or all white carnations. If it was co-dominant, like our checkered chickens, we'd expect checkered carnations. They'd be red and white. So let's take a look at what happens. Actually, something different entirely. With these, we get pink. A red flower and a white flower makes a, a pink flower. It actually kind of makes sense. Um, in this case, we could say it almost looks like it's a blended phenotype. It's not really blending like the Mendelian kind, but it's that idea. So now in this case, we can't say they're both dominant. They don't both show. We use a different phrase. We say that it's incompletely dominant. The red one can't quite beat out the white, but it partially compensates for it. We get some red, but we also get some white. Furthermore, if we keep going, we actually get pink flowers. When we breathe them together, we get red and white back again. So it's not true blending, because pink blended with pink would be more pink. So something else has to be going on here. How do we represent this in a Punnett square? All right, so when we're talking about incompletely dominant traits like carnations, Take a look at the letters that we have set up here. Here's my original red flowered parent, and I've got big R, big R. And here's my original white flowered parent over on the, side, uh, on the side, big W, big W. Again, I'm using two separate capital letters because there's nothing that's recessive. They're both kind of dominant, so we're going to give them both capital letters. And what do we get when we breathe these together? I'm not going to do the whole Punnett square because I bet you could figure it out. But every single square inside of here is going to be R and W. R and W, bottom left is going to be RW. Bottom right is going to be RW. So what do we get for our genotype ratios in this case? Well, 100%, if I could type, RW. They're all heterozygous. What about our phenotypes here? Well, what does RW look like? It's not red. It's not white. It's incompletely dominant. So in this particular case, they are all pink in this, in this one. So what do we got going on here? How many alleles do we have? One more time, we have two alleles. How many phenotypes do we have? In this case, we still have three at this case, right? Red flower, white flower, and then pink flowers. It's a little bit of a different kind of environment here. But what's our expression here? In this case now, it's not both. It's blended, something like that. And it's not truly blended, but it kind of looks like it's blended. So I'll put quotes around it. All right, in summary, what do we get here? Simple dominant traits. This top one, when we've got simple dominance like this, there's only two phenotypes a dominant phenotype and a recessive phenotype. And when we've got that heterozygous condition, one gene of each, it looks like the dominant trait, the recessive gene hides. How about codominant, like our friend the checkered chickens here? Well, in this case, there's three phenotypes. There was a black phenotype, a white phenotype, and then that checkered phenotype. When we get that heterozygous condition with both particular genes there, we actually get both phenotypes fully expressed. So they're black and white. And then the last case, incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance also has three phenotypes, just like codominance does. Both of these are characterized by three different phenotypes. But in this case, the heterozygote looks like a blend between the two. It doesn't look like one or the other. It looks like both blended into one. So again, we've got simple dominant, two phenotypes, 
and it looks dominant when it's heterozygous. We've got co-dominance where they're both expressed, and incomplete dominance where kind of that middle one, neither one wins. Wanting to go further? You're looking for some uh, additional ideas to take a look at. Here are some ideas that you can uh, kind of do some extra research on that all have to do with either um, incomplete dominance or co-dominance, uh, and you can learn uh, learn more. Hope to see you in class tomorrow.